Okay, we're streaming live on Facebook. So Facebook, we are on live. And I apologize, Facebook. I, this is the one morning I forgot to put in on my Facebook page what we're going to be talking about. But hopefully people are still watching this morning. And uh, you are with us as we are talking again about our subject, uh, keeping it in context. That's our series, keeping it in context. And a sub-series, we've been talking about success and prosperity a kingdom perspective. We are talking about, you know, does God want us to succeed? Does God want us to prosper? What we've said is yes, but there's nuances to it. There's ways we need to look at it from a biblical perspective, from a from the perspective of looking at uh, different passages, what they have to say about success, about prosperity, about money. We've been looking at it in a historical, cultural, linguistic, literary context. So we can better understand what exactly is God saying where these things are concerned. We are currently talking about the tithe, and this is kind of under the another topic we began, which is talking about flourishing. We talked about virtues. We began talking about the virtue of righteousness. We said righteous people are generous, and then we began asking, well, right, righteous people are generous, and they give. How, how does that relate to the tithe? What's our relationship to the tithe? What does the Bible really teach and say about the tithe. So that's what we've been looking at. The tithe, seeking to understand the tithe in its original historical, cultural, uh, linguistic, and literary context. So if you've got your Bible, I'd like you to open to Malachi chapter three. And today is part three uh, of the, our series here on the tithe. We're going to be looking at again, what does Malachi chapter three, verse eight through 11 actually say? As I've been saying, when it comes to Malachi, Malachi tends to be the go-to scripture about the tithe. And what I've also been saying is that it is probably, in my opinion, one of the most misunderstood passages that has in the Bible, especially as it has to do with the tithe and it has it to do with giving. I think that Malachi is one of the most misunderstood. So we, we, we've been looking at, we've been looking at the passage that people tend to read. Some churches read it every Sunday as they get ready to take off their, get ready to take up their offering. Malachi chapter three, verse eight, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you in tithes and offerings? You are cursed with a curse for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven, pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And then verse 11 says, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. Okay, so just to do a quick recap of what we kind of covered last week, we saw that the book of Malachi is really speaking to disillusion, rebellious Israel, and to its corrupt priests. The priesthood had become corrupt. As a result of the priesthood becoming corrupt, disobedient, disillusioned, the people of Israel became rebellious. They were not obeying the Torah. God even says in the book of Malachi that the priests were supposed to be teaching the people the Torah, God's instruction, God's guidance, God's teaching for the nation. They had failed to do that. So the people were in rebellion. The people were in disobedience. And we said that this is the context of the book. This is the context in which the words, will a man rob God needs to be read. It needs to be read within the context of the fact that the prophet is speaking on the behalf of God to a disobedient nation. So in context, will a man rob God is really, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a reference to the tithe because it says bring all the tithe to the storehouse, what tithe is it referring to? Well, as we have studied, uh, there are, in the Bible and, and within the context of Judaism, there's three different tithes. There is the ma'atzer ani, this is known as a tithe to the poor. There's the ma'atzer sheni, that's the second tithe. And then there is the ma'atzer rishon, which is the first tithe. And in context, when he talks about bringing the tithes to the storehouse so that there will be food in my house. This is referring to the ma'atzer rishon. This is the tithe that is, was to be brought up to the temple and stored in the storehouses. This is a tithe that was not being brought to the temple. This is the tithe that was not being stored. 
And also, by the way, God makes a reference to bring all the tithes and the offerings. Offerings were also to be brought, tithes and offerings. God said, you're robbing me in tithes and offerings. The offerings were to be brought to the temples, we're going to see in a few minutes, for the priest. But the ma'atzer rishon, which is the first tithe, that's what it means, we find this in Numbers chapter 18. So if you turn there, we're going to look at these passages of scriptures. We do a little quick recap here. Numbers chapter 18. And we're going to look at verse 21, Numbers chapter 18, verse 21. It says, Behold, I've given the children of Levi all the tithes in Israel as an inheritance in return for the work which they perform, the work of the tabernacle of meeting. Now notice this is the tithe that he's given. God said, I've given the children of Levi all the tithes in Israel as an inheritance in return for the work which they perform. So this is a tithe to the tribe of Levi. Hereafter, the children of Israel shall not come near the tabernacle of meeting, lest they bear sin and die. But the Levites shall perform the work of the tabernacle of meeting. They shall bear their iniquity. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations that among the children of Israel, they, the children of Levi, shall have no inheritance, meaning they're not going to have any land. So for the tithes of the children of Israel, which they offer up as a heave offering to the Lord, I have given to the Levites as an inheritance. Therefore, I said to them, among the children of Israel, they shall have no inheritance. So the this is known as, in, in Judaism, this tithe is known as the ma'atzer rishon, the first tithe. If you notice in verse 24, it says, for the tithes of the children of Israel, which they offer up as a heave offering to the Lord, I have given to the Levites as an inheritance. So this tithe is really offered to the Lord, and the Lord gives the tithe to the Levites, okay? That's important. The tithe is offered to the Lord. It's God's tithe. He gives the tithes to the Levites. Um, if you look at verse 12 and verse 14, verse 12 and verse 14, it says, all the best of the oil, this is Numbers 18 still, all the best of the oil, all the best of the new wine and the grain, their first fruits, which they offer to the Lord, I have given them to you, whatever the first, whatever the first ripe fruit is in their land, which they bring to the Lord shall be yours. Everyone who is clean in your house may eat it. Every devoted thing in Israel shall be yours. Now, what I should have done is have you read verse eight first. And the Lord said to Aaron here, this is verse eight, here I myself has also, have also given you charge of my heave offerings, all the holy gifts of the children of Israel. I have given them as a portion to you and your sons as an ordinance forever. So in this passage and in verse 12 through 14 that we just read, God is speaking specifically to Aaron and his son. Now, Aaron, is, Aaron and his sons, they are part of the tribe of Levi. But God, So what God did was he had the 12 tribes. God set aside the tribe of Levi to be a priestly tribe. Then from within the tribe of Levi, Levi, he set aside the sons of Aaron to be the Kohanim, to be the priest who would offer up the sacrifices. The Levites, the tribe as a whole, they would do certain jobs around the temple. There were certain things that they were to take charge of and to do to, for the upkeep of the temple. But the priest, the Kohanim, who were the sons of Aaron, they were descendants of Aaron, they were responsible for offering up the sacrifices. So you see, God here, he made a division. You got the people of Israel. Out of the people of Israel, he took the tribe of Levi. They are a priestly tribe. Out of the priestly tribe, he took the sons of Aaron. They are the Kohanim. They are the priests to Israel who offer, who stand before the Lord, and they offer the sacrifices. Uh, one of Aaron's sons would end up being the high priest. Aaron was the high priest who would go in before the Lord. Now, to the sons of Aaron, verse 12 and verse 14, God says, the best of the oil, all the best of the new wine and the grain, the first fruits which they offer to the Lord, I have given them to you. This is to the sons of Aaron. This is not to the Levitical tribe. This is to the sons of Aaron within the tribe. Whatever first ripe fruit is in their land, which they bring to the Lord, shall be yours. Everyone who is clean in your house may eat it. Every devoted thing in Israel shall be yours. So the reason I read this is these are the offerings that were to be brought to the Kohanim, the priests. When God says to Israel, you've robbed me in tithes and offerings, these are the offerings. Okay, uh, and they belong to the Lord, 
but he gives it to the priest. The tithes belong to the Lord, he gives it to the, the Levites. The offerings belong to the Lord, he gives it to the Kohanim, the priest. The Encyclopedia Jude Judaica actually says, um, and this is, let me show you, I, I, I love this. This is given to me by my mentor. This is one of the volume 15 of the Encyclopedia Judaica. This is given to me by Dr. William Bean before he passed away. Um, and it's just uh, an encyclopedia of things that have to do with Judaism. So in the Encyclopedia Judaica, volume 15, it says, the gifts offered to the Lord are identical with the gifts of the priest. So when they're offering these gifts to the Lord, they're offering, uh, they're giving them to the priest, but the gifts are to the Lord, the offerings are to the Lord, the tithes are the Lord's, but he gives them to the priest. They are identical. Now, why is this important? Because if you're not bringing the tithes to the Levites, that means you're not bringing it to God. So to rob the Levites was to rob God. So when God says that uh, you have robbed me, he says, wherein have you robbed me? He says in tithes and in offerings. What is he saying? He's saying, you're not bringing to the Levites, you're not bringing to the priests the offerings that belong to me that I give to them. So if you're not giving it to them, that means you're not bringing it to me. So you've robbed me. You've kept back what is mine, which I give unto them. This is also called forsaking the house of the Lord. Turn to Nehemiah chapter 13. Nehemiah chapter 13. Nehemiah, and we're going to look at chapter, oops, too far there. Nehemiah chapter 13. The idea of robbing God, another way of saying it is they are forsaking the house of the Lord. Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 10, God said this, oh, well, it's, it's Nehemiah speaking. It says, I also realize that the portions for the Levites had not been given to them. Now, this again is going back to uh, that tithes were not being, in the days of Nehemiah, tithes were not being brought to the, to the temple. And he says in verse 10, I also realized that portions for the Levite had not been given to them. What does that mean? That means that the Ma'atzer Rishon was not being, that, that first tithe was not being brought to the temple. So I realized that the portions for the Levites had not been given them for each of the Levites and the singers who did the work had gone back to his field. So I contended with the rulers and said, why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their place. So the house of God is forsaken. Mean number one, the Levites have gone away. The Levites have, they're, they're not working in the house and it's been forsaken because the food has not been brought to the Levites. They don't have any provision. So the house of God, the people have forsaken the house of God. They're thinking about themselves. Again, Israel is in disobedience. They're not thinking about the house of the Lord, they're not thinking about the servants of the Lord. They are serving their own selves. They're not bringing the tithes and the offerings. So the people are going without. So let's let's talk about for a moment, because we do, I, I touched on this, I referenced it, but I didn't go into detail about it. The provision for the Kohanim, the provision for the priest. Okay. And so let me let me just say this again. When you do not, when when not you, but when the people did not bring the tithes to the house of the Lord, it caused the Levites to be forsaken. And, and, and it was uh, symptomatic of the fact that the people had forsaken the house of the Lord because they were not bringing the provision for the Levites and for the priest. Okay. That's the point I was trying to make. Okay. So what was the provision for the priest? What was the provision? Well, we saw number one, they are to be given uh, offerings. The Levites were also the Levites, the priestly tribe was to tithe to the Kohanim, the priests, or the sons of Aaron. Let me say again, remember, we have the 12 tribes of Israel. Out of the 12 tribes, God takes one of the tribes, Levi, and he makes them a priestly tribe. Out of the priestly tribe of Levi, he takes the sons of Aaron, and they become the Kohanim, the priests who minister before the Lord, right? Okay. What the, the tribe of Levi was to do, once, if, if you and I were Israelites in the time of the temple, we would bring our tithes to the to the temple, the Ma'atzer Rishon, and we would they would be it would be given to the Levites. What the Levites were then supposed to do is take a tithe of their tithe and give it to the Kohanim, give it to the priests. Did you know that? Did you know that the Levites took a tithe of their tithe and gave it to the priests? Go to Numbers chapter eighteen. Let's go back there, Numbers chapter eighteen, and we're going to look at verse twenty four. Numbers 18 and verse 24. Okay, Numbers 18, verse 24 says, for the tithes of the children of Israel, which they offer up as a heave offering 
So what is, yeah. For the tithes of the children of Israel, which they offer up as a heave offering to the Lord, I have given to the Levites as an inheritance. Therefore, I have said to them, among the children of Israel, they, the Levites, shall have no inheritance. means they have no land. Verse 25. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, speak thus to the Levites and say to them, when you take from the children of Israel the tithes, which I have given you from them as your inheritance, then you shall offer up a heave offering of, the, of it to the Lord, a tenth of the tithe. Now, in Hebrew, this is known as the ma'atzer min ha-ma'atzer. Ma'atzer min, M-I-N, uh, ma'atzer min ha-ma'atzer, the tithe of the tithe. Okay, so he says, when you take of the children of Israel the tithes which I have given to you from them as your inheritance, then you shall offer up a heave offering of it to the Lord, a tenth of the tithe. And your heave offering, by the way, notice this is an offering. Remember, wherein have you robbed me? In tithes and in offerings. You, your heave offering shall be reckoned to you as though it were the grain of the threshing floor and as the fullness of the wine press. Thus you shall also offer a heave offering to the Lord from all your tithes. Now, he's talking to the Levites now, not talking to the children of Israel. He says, to the Levites, you shall offer a heave offering of the Lord from all your tithes, which you have received from the children of Israel, and you shall give the Lord's heave offering from it to Aaron the priest. Of all your gifts, you shall offer up every heave offering due to the Lord from all of the best of them, the, con the consecrated part of them. So they were to offer this tithe, the ma'atzer min ha'ma'atzer, and this is the tithe of the tithe. So the Levites was to give this to the Kohanim, to Aaron, to his sons and his daughters. So the priests, the sons of Aaron, um, receive the tithe from the Levites. So the Levites tithe. So technically speaking, there's four tithes, okay? So there is the ma'atzer rishon, the first tithe. There is the ma'atzer sheni, the second tithe. This is the tithe that Israel was to bring up to Jerusalem, and they were to eat it before the Lord. There is the ma'atzer ani that was offered every third and sixth year. This is the tithe to the poor. They did not bring this up to Jerusalem according to the Torah. They were to keep it in their towns, and they were to give it to the Levites, the fatherless, the widow, to the poor among them. And then there is the ma'atzer min ha'ma'atzer. This is the tithe of the tithe. This is what the Levites offered to the sons of Aaron, to the Kohanim, to the priests who served before the Lord. So technically, if you count it all out, there's like four tithes, or again, three, depending on how you look at it. Some people see the, the tithe, the ma'aser ani, offered in year three and offered in year six. This tithe replaced the ma'aser sheni uh, tithe that was offered in year one, two, four, and five. I know it's a little bit confusing, but it, it, for clarity's sake, let's say, technically speaking, there were four tithes, okay? There, there were four, we can look upon it as being four tithes, four or three, depending on how you want to comment. My point here is that there was another tithe that was given to the Levites. Uh, that's, excuse me, another tithe is given by the Levites to the Kohanim, to the priests, the sons of Aaron. Also, the priests, the sons of Aaron, were to be given all of the first fruits and the heave offerings. We just really read all of that, so I won't go back over that passage in Numbers chapter 8, verse, eight, uh, Numbers ch chapter 18, verses 8 through 19. Actually, we probably should look at that. Go to Numbers chapter uh, 18 again. Look at verse 8. We read uh, part of that already, but look at verse 8. And the Lord spoke to Aaron. Actually, I'd read this too. The Lord spoke to Aaron saying, here I myself have also given you charge of my heave offerings and all the holy gifts of the children of Israel. I have given them as a portion to you and your sons as an ordinance forever. This shall be your, yours of the most holy things reserved from the fire. Every offering of theirs, every grain offering, every sin offering, every trespass offering which they render to me shall be most holy for you and your sons. In a most holy place, you shall eat it. Every male shall eat it. It shall be holy to you. This also is yours, the heave offerings of their gift with all the wave offerings of the children of Israel. I have given them to you and your sons and daughters with you as an ordinance forever. Everyone who is clean in your house may eat of it. And all of the best oil, all of the best of the new wine and the grain, their first fruits, which they offer to the Lord, I have given them to you. Whatever first ripe fruit is in their land, which they bring to the Lord shall be yours. Everyone who is clean in your house may eat it. Every devoted 
every devoted thing in Israel shall be yours. Everything that first opens the womb of all flesh, which they bring to the Lord, whether man or beast, shall be yours. Nevertheless, the first, firstborn of man you shall surely redeem, and the firstborn of unclean animals you shall redeem. And those redeemed of the devoted things you shall redeem when one month old, according to your valuation, for five shekels of silver, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, which is 20 geras. But the firstborn of a cow, the firstborn of a sheep, the firstborn of a goat, you shall not redeem. They are holy. You shall sprinkle their blood on the altar, burn their fat as an offering made by fire for a sweet aroma to the Lord, and their flesh shall be yours, just as the wave breast and the right thigh are yours. Verse 19, all the heave offerings of the holy things, which the children of Israel offer to the Lord, I have given to you and your sons and daughters with you as an ordinance forever. It is a covenant of salt forever before the Lord with you and your descendants with you. So again, I read all that to say all of these offerings belong to the Kohanim, the priests, the sons and daughters of Aaron. And again, these are the offerings when God says you have robbed me in tithes and offerings. These are the offerings that God is speaking of. These are not voluntary. These are not free will offerings. Often when I hear people teach on the tithe, they go, well, the 10% is obligatory. You have to bring the tithe, but your offerings are free will. There were free will offerings, but in context, when God says you have robbed me in tithes and in offerings, he's talking about these offerings here in Numbers chapter 18. These are obligatory. These are devoted to the Lord. These have to be brought. So this so number, so the teaching that says, well, anything you give a, a, above the tithe is an offering. You can do that a free will. It's, it's yours to keep. You know, the, in other words, they'll go, you give the 10%, the 90% is yours. And from the 90%, you can offer a free will offering. That is not what numbers, uh, excuse me, that's not what Malachi chapter three is referring to when it says offerings. It's talking about these obligatory offerings that we just read that the people of Israel had to bring because they were holy and devoted to the Lord. And the Lord said, what they bring to me Sons of Aaron, Kohanim, the priest, your sons and daughters, I'm giving them to you. I'm giving them to you, Aaron, and to your sons and your daughters. It is a statute in Israel forever. Okay, so, so when we're talking about reading in context, doing exegesis, not eisegesis, reading what's there in the text, not reading something into the text, but bringing out what the text actually says, not putting our own thoughts, not putting on our own beliefs or, or theological ideologies into the text. This is what a lot of people have done with Malachi chapter three. So if, if let me say this for a moment, if you are a pastor and you're teaching this, it's not correct biblically to say that, well, these offerings here in Malachi chapter three are free will offerings. You're obligated to bring the tithe, but the offerings are free will. No, these offerings in context were obligatory also. Okay, they were obligatory. So this idea about it being free offerings, not correct biblically. All right, so in Malachi chapter three, the people of Israel, they're not bringing the tithes and the offerings that um, belong to the Lord and that he gave to the priest and Levites because they needed to be supported because they had no inheritance. Uh, wait a minute, what am, I'm, I'm reading something wrong here. So in Malachi chapter three, uh, the, the tithes and the offerings that the people have to bring are the is the ma'atzer rishon and the offerings of first fruits and grains and stuff. That's what they are to bring. They are to bring this because the people of the the, the Levites and the Kohanim they don't have an inheritance with the rest of the people of Israel. So um, so they, they're bringing this because. What am I trying to say here? They're bringing this because the people of Israel don't have the, let me, again, let me, let me back up, slow down. They are told in Malachi chapter three, I need you to bring all the tithes. God says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. It is the Ma'atzer uh, uh, Rishon, the first tithe. And it is all of the offerings that they were obliged to bring. It was an obligatory, obligatory offerings. God says you're to bring all this so that there might be food in my house. OK, they are to bring all of this so that there would be food in God's house. The food that God is speaking of here is literal food. In Malachi chapter three is when he says, bring you all the tithes into the storehouse so that there might be meat or food in my house. 
That's literal food. He's not talking about spiritual food. He's not talking about the will of God. So again, people say that. They go, well, you know, you got to bring your tithe to the local church so there can be food, so there can be the word of God in your church. Technically speaking, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Unless you try to say, well, you know, pastors need to be supported so they can study God's word. That way you can have spiritual food. However, even if you were to say, which would be incorrect to say, the pastors are the Levites, they're the priests, uh, the, 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 the tithe was brought to the priests so that they would have something to eat. It was not so that the priest would provide spiritual food for the people. That was not the teaching of Malachi chapter three. When God says, bring all the tithes into my storehouse. Remember we saw last week, there were storehouses. There were storerooms in the temple where they kept all of this food. It was literal food. So it was not money. Uh, this was not money so that there would be spiritual food. In other words, the word of God in local churches, this is often taught. It is not financial resources to pay for the church's staff's uh, salary for those that are on staff. This was not what it was. It was not money. It was food. Uh, it was not used to pay for utilities of the temple. <laughs> it was not used for various church programs. I heard one pastor say, well, you know, bring all the tithes. He was teaching the traditional teaching about the tithes. Bring all the tithes to the storehouse so that there might be food in my house. And he says, you know, I thank God that our people here tithe and we have money. And just this week we got food in the house and we were able to send money to Haiti. Now that's a good thing that they were to send money in Haiti. I would say right practice, wrong scripture. Because again, he was applying Malachi chapter three to say that the money that was brought was the food. It was the resources, uh, financial resources, so they could fund their church programs. Now, funding church programs is a good thing. Helping people in need is a good thing. However, to utilize Malachi chapter three to say that the food, that when God says bring all the tithes so that there might be food, we have spiritualized it and said, well, that's money to be in the local church. And it is not, as we said before, the storehouse is not the local church. The storehouse is not the tithe. The storehouse was a storehouse to keep food to take care of the Levites and the priest. Okay, so it's not money. It's not financial resources to pay the staff of church members. It's not financial resources for utilities. It's not financial resources to, to fund various church programs. We are taking the passage out of its context when we say that that is what it means. That's not what it means historically. It's not what it meant culturally. Now, something else I want to share with you. I hope that's clear. And again, let me say, I want to say this because I don't want to seem like, are you saying, Mike, we should not support the church? No, you should support the church. There are people that support the oasis, okay? Uh, and we should be generous. I have long taught and do teach. We should be generous, what I'm saying to you is this teaching, the way we've presented Malachi chapter three has been out of its context, it's been wrong, and it has put people in bondage. And now some people say, well, I've never been in bondage. W wonderful. But it has put people in bondage because of wrong teaching. And sometimes it's called disillusionment among people because people didn't get the results that they were expecting, that they were told based upon Malachi chapter three, but they were taught Malachi chapter three out of its context and in truth, it was being taught in error. Now, here's something I wanted to share with you that I kind of referenced last week. And that is the possibility that the priest, the Kohanim, the priests, were complicit in the Levites being neglected and going without. The priests. Remember, we just read in Nehemiah a little bit earlier. Nehemiah said, I came to Jerusalem and I saw that the priests had left and that the priests were not being given their portion. It is very possible that the priests during the time of Malachi were complicit. During the time of Nehemiah, they may have been complicit, and during the time of Malachi. And the reason I separate it out like that is because we're not really clear about when Malachi was written. Scholars are not clear on the date. There are some scholars who hold, as I said last week, that Malachi is a contemporary of Nehemiah and Ezra. There are other scholars who says, no, we don't think that's so because of the internal evidence of, of Malachi. It looks like he uh, may, may have come at a different time. Um, I, either way, when we look at Malachi, it's very possible that the priests were complicit for, for the uh, uh, times not being brought to the 
temple, the Matzah Rishon, which means that the Levites were not getting what they needed. Now, why do I say that? According to the Encyclopedia Judaica, volume 15 that I just showed you, uh, and according to the book, Jerusalem in the Time of Jesus by uh, uh, Yochim Yeremias, I hope I pronounced his name correctly, J-O-A-C-H-I-M, Yochim Yeremias, and this is his book here, Jerusalem in the Time of Jesus. They both report in their book uh, that when the temple was rebuilt, which we now refer to when that temple was rebuilt in the time of Nehemiah, to be built in the time of Malachi, that, that's known as the second temple period. That's the start of the second temple period. During this time, the collecting of the Ma'atzer Rishon was transferred from the Levites to the priest. Now, we read earlier that it was the Levites who were to collect the tithes. And then they would give, remember we read it, the Levites would collect the tithes, the tithe belonged to them, the ma'atzer rishon. They would take a tenth of that, the ma'atzer min ha ma'atzer, they would tithe the tenth of their tenth and give it to the priest, right? Okay, according to Encyclopedia Judaica, volume 15, according to Yochim Yeremias in Jerusalem, the time of Jesus, when the temple was rebuilt, the collecting of the ma'atzer rishon was transferred from the Levites to the priests. In other words, the Levites stopped collecting it and the priests, the Kohanim, the sons of Aaron, they began to collect it. According to the Encyclopedia Judaica, there were very few Levites in the second temple period, according to the Encyclopedia Judaica. So according to the Encyclopedia Judaica, quote, the tithe was automatically shifted to the priest. Because there were not a lot of Levites, it automatically shifted to the priest. As a matter of fact, in the Talmud, which is a Jewish writing, in the Talmud, uh, it's commentary on the Torah, in the Talmud, one of the reasons for this change is said to be that Ezra, quote, Ezra punished the Levites because they did not go up from Babylon to Jerusalem. You have to remember that during this time, Israel is in exile. They were under Babylonian rule during the time of Ezra. They did not come up from, uh, he said that Ezra looked at it and said that some of, uh, many of the Levites did not come up from Babylon to Jerusalem for the rebuilding of the temple and to get the temple sacrifices and the temple services started all over again. So according to the Talmud, it says that Ezra punished the Levites because they did not go up from Babylon to Jerusalem. And the way that they were punished is that there was a shift of the tithes being collected by the Levites, it now went from the Levites to the priests. The Levites were no longer going to collect. I hope everybody can hear me. There was a gardener outside and my window was slightly open. But the the uh, the Levites were no longer going to protect, uh, going to collect the tithes. It was going to be the priests. The priests, the Kohanim, were now going to do it. And this is because there were there were not a lot of there were not a lot of Levites. All right. Turn over to Nehemiah chapter 13. Again, we're going to go back there. Nehemiah chapter 13. Nehemiah, we're going to look at verse uh, 10 again. Nehemiah 13. Now, I want you to notice something. Nehemiah 13. Oh, I'm on Nehemiah 10. Nehemiah 13, look at verse 10. Oh, wait a minute. This is not right. I'm in numbers. <laughs> That's not going to help me. Okay. Nehemiah. Let me go to Nehemiah. Here we go. Nehemiah chapter 13 and verse 10. It says, I also realize, verse 10, I also realize that the portions for the Levites had not been given them. For each of the Levites and the singers who did the work had gone back to his field. So in the time of Nehemiah, whether he was a contemporary of Malachi or not, in the time of Nehemiah, the Levites had not been given their portion. It's interesting that he, he mentions and he talks about the fact that the Levites were being neglected. He did not say that the Kohanim were neglected. He said the Levites. He says nothing about the priests being neglected. It is the Levites who are neglected. Okay. Um, so again, Nehemiah may not have been doing the time of Malachi. Scholars, again, are uncertain about it. However, the practice of the tithe being collected by the priests rather than the Levites, was taking place in the period of the second temple, which was also the time of Malachi. We know that during the time of Jesus that this was happening because we have writings from Josephus who talk about the high priest 
who's a priest, sending his people in to gather the tithes and then giving the tithes out to the other priest. Josephus talks about this. So in the time of Jesus, which is also the time of the second temple period, we know that this is happening. So, and also this is what we know about the priest during the time of Malachi, whether he was a contemporary of Nehemiah or not. The priest during Malachi's time were corrupt. The priest during Malachi's time, they were not following the Torah. We know that from Malachi chapter one and Malachi chapter two, there was corruption in the priesthood. We know that they were not following and obeying the Torah. So it is possible that part of the corruption of the, of the priests is that they were keeping back part of the tithes that were supposed to go to the Levites. This would mean that not only the nation, but also the priests were robbing God and thus robbing the Levites. In other words, the priests were keeping for them, making sure that they were being taken care of, but they were not making sure that the Levites got what they needed. And by not giving the Levite, if the priest, and by the way, it was contrary to the Torah, if the priests are going to collect the tithes, it's supposed to be the Levites. Uh, and Nehemiah talks about the fact, I want you to notice something. Go back to Nehemiah chapter 13. Uh, let's see if I can find it here. Uh, maybe it's not here. I want you to go to chapter 10. Yeah, chapter 10, look at verse, um, let's start at verse, uh, look at, start at verse 35. And we made ordinances to bring the first fruit of our ground and the first fruit of all trees year by year to the house of the Lord. Now, with these first fruits, these are the offerings that are obligatory upon Israel. They have to bring these for the Kohanim, for the priest. Uh, we made an ordinance to bring the firstborn of our sons and our cattle, as it is written in the law, and the firstborn of our herds and our flocks to the house of our God, to the priest who minister in the house of our God, to bring the first fruits of our dough, our offering, the first from all kind of trees, the new wine and oil, to the priest. Now, by the way, it's brought to the priest, not to the Levites. This is the offerings that are brought to the Levite, uh, to the priest. So the new wine and oil to the priest, to the storeroom, storerooms of the house of our God, and to bring the tithes of our land to the Levites, for the Levites should receive the tithes in all our farming communities. Notice this, the, the, the first fruits of the ground, of the trees, of the firstborn, of the herd, these are brought to the priest, but the tithes are brought to the Levites in all of our farming communities. And the priest, now notice this, verse 38, the priest, the descendants of Aaron, shall be with the Levites when the Levites receive tithes. And the Levites shall bring up a tenth of the tithe to the house of our God, to the rooms of the storehouse. Now, again, according to the Encyclopedia of Judaica, according to Jerusalem in the time of Jesus, what was happening during this time is that it was it shifted from the uh, Levites to the priests, and that the priests were there, and the priests were the ones collecting the tithes. So it is very possible, as I said before, that the priests were holding back and not giving to the Levites their portion. So this means, if, and if this was taking place in the time of Malachi, this would mean that not only, and we again, we know that the priests, specifically, Malachi calls out the priests, the Kohanim. They are corrupt. They, they say that the table of the Lord is contemptible. They are offering bad sacrifices to God. I am suggesting, as some other scholars have suggested, not all, but some, that maybe what was happening here is that the priests were also complicit in holding back from the Levites. And this is why the Levites were going without. And this is why there was no food in the house of the Lord because of the corruption of the, of the priests. They were holding back as well as the people holding back. Again, some scholars believe this. Some of the scholars I read actually believe that primarily when it says, will a man rob God, they're talking to the priest. I think it's talking to the nations and very possibly to the priests. Won't be dogmatic about it, but when, we, when you look at it, you see that, hey, priests are collecting during this time and there is no food in the house of God, meaning that the Levites are not being taken care of, just like in, the, in Nehemiah, it could be that the priests are holding back, thinking about themselves and they're not taking care of their brethren. Okay, just wanted to put that out there to let you know that that's also a possibility. What's the main point here? The main point is that Malachi is talking to, this is our, I'm going to finish up the recap. Malachi is talking to, and he's rebuking those who are not providing for God's priest and the Levites because they are not giving a specific tithe. The Ma'atzer Rishon 
and they're also not bringing the obligatory offerings that are due to the priest. This could be why one of the reasons maybe the priest was holding back. I was thinking about it, and I was thinking maybe one of the priests, one of the reasons the priests were holding back is because their offerings are not being brought to them. They are not getting what they're supposed to get. So we know there's a lot of corruption going on. The people of Israel are not offering what they're supposed to. The priests are, co are corrupt. They're offering bad offerings unto the Lord. The Levites are not being taken care of. And this is because Israel is in a state of disobedience and rebellion. So this call, when God says in Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 through 11, bring all the tithes, this, as we said last week, is a call to repentance. He said, return to me, and I will return to you in Malachi chapter 3. They said, how shall we return? And God says, uh, will a man rob God? How we robbed you in tithes and in offerings. So the one of the ways, one, not the only, one of the ways they show repentance is by beginning to obey the Torah where the tithes and the offerings were concerned. This was part of the message, one of the main messages of Malachi. It is speaking to a people who are disobedient to God. All right, so that's my recap. I added in some more extra information that we didn't cover last week. This is so Malachi chapter three, Verses 8 through 11 is not talking to the church, telling the church that you need to bring the tithe. And if you don't bring the tithe, you are going to uh, be cursed and you are a disobedient to God. This is talking to a people who are already in disobedience to God. It's talking to the nation of Israel. Okay, Malachi chapter 3, verse 10 through 11. Let's go back there again. Now we're going to cover another part of this. And by the way, I hope this made sense. If it made sense, let me know in the comment section, those of you that are watching on Facebook and those of you in the Zoom room, let me know. Yep, Mike, you're making sense here. We understand we're following you. If you got a question, Post your question, and I will respond to it as best I can. All right. By the way, for those of you on Facebook, I can't because I don't, I don't see your question, so I'll respond next week. Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 again says, uh, well, I'll start at verse 10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there might be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. Let me stop there for a second. I say, do I want to cover this now? No, I'll cover it next time. Okay, so God says, try me now in this. We're going to cover this. What does that mean? Says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the window of heaven and pour you out such blessing so that there will be no room to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you, for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. Okay, so here's the question that we're going to look at now and cover in the rest of our session today. What are the windows of heaven that God is talking about here? What is the blessing that will be poured out so that there's not room enough to contain it? Who or what is the devourer? This is what I promised you that I was going to cover this week. Okay, first of all, let's talk about windows of heaven in context. What are the windows of heaven? When we look in the scripture, we see that this phrase has been used more than once. Let's look at two. Go to Genesis chapter 7. Genesis chapter 7. And we're going to look at verse 11. Genesis chapter 7 verse 11. Genesis 7, 11 says, um, I'm going to start at verse 10. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were on the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were open and the rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Notice this, the depths were broken up, the windows of heaven were open, and the rain was on the earth 40 days and 49. Look at Genesis chapter 8, verse, we'll start at verse 1 and 2. Then God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark. God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the water subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were also stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. Okay. So when we talk about the windows of heaven, God says, I will open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing so that there's not room enough to contain it. What is God referring to? In context, the windows of heaven refer to God pouring out rain upon the earth. It's rain. Now, in this context, is, is rain of judgment upon the people of earth, but it, it is rain that's being poured out. You see, rain was considered one of God's blessings and one of God's treasures. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 28. Rain was considered one of God's blessing and one of God's treasures that, were, that was given from heaven. Deuteronomy chapter 28. We're going to look at verse 12. Deuteronomy 28, verse 12. Now, here is where God is talking about 
uh, blessing Israel if they keep the commandments, if they walk in covenant. Verse 12, it says, the Lord will open to you his good treasure, the heavens, to give the rain to your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hand. You shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. Notice this, the Lord will open to you his good treasure. What is it? The heavens. This is treasurer house to give the rain to your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hand. So rain was considered a blessing. We also know this from Jesus' teachings. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 through 45, Jesus says this. You can read it later. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 through 45. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those that hate you, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for or because he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Now, notice it says he sends his rain on the just and on the unjust. What's the context of Jesus teaching here? Jesus here is teaching that you are to love and you're to bless even those that you are in conflict with. He says, love your neighbor. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor, the person you're close to that you're in good relationship with, but hate your enemy. Your enemy here is your neighbor that you're in conflict with. It could be your brother that you're in conflict with. It could be a friend that you're in conflict with. And, and, and Jesus was saying, there are those who are teaching, it's okay to hate your enemy. He said, but I say to you, love the one that you're in conflict with. Love the one who's in opposition to you. Bless them. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who are hating you and who may be doing evil to you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. So those who are doing you wrong, that are not treating you right, Jesus said, I want you to be a blessing to them. And then he goes, that way you're going to be just like your father in heaven. How, how Jesus? Because your father in heaven, he makes his son rise on the evil, those that are evil and opposed to him, and on the good. He causes his rain. He sends his rain on the just, those who are righteous and live in harmony with him and on the unjust, those who are against him, okay? The context here is blessing those who are in opposition to you and that you may be in opposition with. Jesus said, bless them, you'll be like God when you do that. And it says, God causes his reign. He sends his son and his reign upon the evil and upon the unjust also. So reign and son are seen as good. They are good. They are a blessing. Why is rain a blessing in this context? Because this is an ag agrarian or an agricultural society. This is a farming society, and they need sun and they need rain to water the crops. They need the sun to give life to the crops so they will grow. This is why it is considered a blessing. As a matter of fact, go to Deuteronomy chapter 28. The withholding of rain was seen as a curse. The giving of rain was seen as a blessing. The withholding of rain is seen as a curse. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28. We're going to look at verse 23. Deuteronomy 28, verse 23. And it says, God, he's, this is what will happen to the people of Israel. If they are in disobedience to the Lord, they're not walking in covenant, they're serving other gods. This is what happened. It says, um, Verse 23, and your heavens, which are over your head, shall be bronze, and the earth, which is under your feet, shall be iron. The Lord will change the rain of your land to powder and dust. From the heaven, it shall come down on you until you are destroyed. So notice here, when Israel is not walking in covenant relationship, covenant obedience to God, the heavens become bronze, meaning nothing is coming down. There is no rain coming out. There is no rain to open up. Uh, there is no, the heavens are not opening up and the rain is not coming down to water the land. And he says, I'm going to make your rain like dust and powder. That's a curse, not a blessing. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11. My point here is that the withholding of rain is seen as a curse. The giving of rain is a blessing. The withholding of rain is a curse. Deuteronomy chapter 11, we're going to look at verse... 16. Deuteronomy 11, verse 16. Verse 16. This is, again, what happens when Israel is disobedient to the covenant, uh, to their covenant with God. Take heed to yourselves, lest your heart be deceived. 
you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Lest the Lord anger be aroused against you and he shut up the heavens so that there be no rain and the land yield no produce and you perish quickly from the good land which the Lord is giving you. So if there is no rain, there is no blessing. There is no produce. So what is the blessing? We know the windows of heaven now, that's rain. What is the blessing? It's number one, the rain, and it is what the rain will produce, which is abundant crops. The blessing is the rain and what the rain will produce, which is abundant crops. Look at Deuteronomy, you're in Deuteronomy chapter 11. Look at verse 10 now. Deuteronomy 11, verse 10. For the land which you go to possess it is not like the land of Egypt, from which you have come, where you sowed your seed and watered it by foot as a vegetable garden. But the land which you cross over to possess it is a land of hills and valleys, which drinks water from the rain of heaven, a land for which the Lord your God cares. The eyes of the Lord your God are always on it from the beginning of the year to the very end of the year. Verse 13, and it shall be that if you earnestly obey my commandments, which I command you today, to love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, that I will give you the rain for your land in season. Notice this, the early rain and the latter rain so that you may gather in your grain, your new wine and your oil. I will send grass in your fields for your livestock that you may eat and be filled. So what's the blessing? God says, I'm going to pour out rain. Not only is he just going to pour out rain. Remember he says in Malachi, I will open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing so that there's not room enough to contain it. Meaning what? The word pour out means to empty out. He's emptying out something abundantly. He's pouring out abundant blessing. What's the abundant blessing for an agrarian agricultural society? Abundance of rain. God said, I'm going to send the early rain and the latter rain. That's an abundance of rain to water the land. And then he says, I'm going to cause your crops to grow. You're going to have an abundance of crops. You're going to have an abundance of grass for your cattle. That is the blessing. So the when he says, I'm going to open you up the windows of heaven, it's being practical. It's being real. It's not being spiritual. He's not spiritualizing it. People spiritualize this all the time. Well, you know, the blessing can be, you know, that uh, just a closer relationship with God. You know, it's not always money. In this context, it's not money at all. <laughs> and he's not talking... A closer relationship with God is a blessing, but that's not the context. The context here has to do with the agricultural produce of the people. Abundance of rain, the early rain, the latter rain, abundance of rain. Because if you are a farmer, the last thing you want is a lack of rain. And that's always a danger. So God is saying, I'm going to bring you an abundance of rain, and that's going to cause an abundance of crops. You're going to have a blessing where there is not room enough to contain it. This is the blessing that is being poured out. This is the blessing of rain and abundance of crops. So the context in Malachi has to do with rain, it has to do with crops, not money. To, if we make it money, we have to add something to the text that doesn't fit the text historically, culturally, or linguistically. If, you, if we say, hey, this is talking about money, it's not talking about money. It's talking about, excuse me, it's talking about crops okay uh so the question i'm getting is so how should we tie <laughs> stay stay with me paula i'm coming to that we, we won't well okay so the question becomes how should we tie that actually i've already answered this and that is technically speaking and we're going to be going to the new testament i'm discovering all these scripture is that we're not called to tie there is no, because you cannot, number one, as I've said before, and, this, and, and the person I re reference is a member of our fellowship, you cannot tie, Christians cannot tie according to scripture. One of the things that we're going to see in the coming weeks is that money is never liable to the tie. I defy anyone to bring me any passage of scripture where it says you must give 10% of your money. Money was never, money never came under the category of tithe. It never did. Now there was a time in Israel's history when, when money did come liable to tithing. We're gonna talk about that. It's a concept known as ma'atzer kesafim. It's like, oh my gosh, another ma'atzer? Yes, <laughs> we're gonna talk about it. Ma'atzer kesafim, we're gonna talk about that in detail. But in the biblical text, 
God never asked for a tithe of money. Never, never, never. I defy anyone. Now, people will say, well, the reason they, God didn't ask for a tithe of money was because it was an agriculture society and they didn't have money. Untrue. That's not true. They did have money or they had silver that they would trade with. Uh, matter of fact, remember we talked about the second tithe, the Ma'atzer Sheni? This is the tithe you would bring up to Jerusalem and you would present it to the Lord. And then you would consume it before the Lord. You and your family, and you would invite others. You could invite the poor, the Levites. You would consume this tithe before the Lord. Well, what if God had blessed you so much? Let's say you were a farmer in ancient Israel. God has blessed you so much, and you're bringing up your tithe, but it's too much. It's too heavy. What did God say do? He says, I want you to take it, and I want you to, uh, to, to the appropriate person, probably a priest um, or someone that you could sell it to. And he says, what I want you to do is I want you to convert the tithe into money. This is what it says in the biblical text. We're going to be looking at it. You convert the tithe to money. Then you take the money up to Jerusalem and you buy whatever your hearts desire. My point here is that they had money. We're going to look at this in more detail. There was money. God only asked for a tithe upon the produce of the land and upon the animals. We'll talk about that more next week. So my point has always been, I don't know of any church I don't know of any Christian where people are practicing the tithe according to scripture. I don't know. I hear people, and, I, and I, I'm not trying to be mean when I say this, but again, I hear people say, oh, we tithe according to scripture. I go, oh, nobody tithes according to scripture. Because in order to tithe according to the scripture, you have to bring your tithe once a year. You have to bring your tithes within a seven-year cycle. In the, in the seventh year, you do not bring a tithe whatsoever. This is according to the Torah. And then in the third and the sixth year, you don't even bring your tithe to Jerusalem. That's the ma'atzer ani, the tithe to the poor. You keep it within your gates and you give that tithe to the poor that is among you, the Levites, the fatherless, the stranger, and the widow. It is to not go up to Jerusalem. It is to be kept to provide for the poor in your community. This is, if we were living in ancient Israel, this is how we were to do the tithe. I don't know any church that tithes this way. And then you have the Ma'atzer min ma'atzer, the tithe that the Levites gave to the priest. That's another tithe. Again, I don't know any tithe, any church that tithes. And, and the, the biggest thing is this: tithe was not done with money. Tithe was only done with what we call food stuff, protos. We're going to get more into that. So, I, I, though I'm jumping the gun, are you obligated to tithe today? According to the scriptures, according to everything we've looked at, no. I cannot find one scripture in the Hebrew text, I cannot, in the Tanakh, what we call the Old Testament, or in the New Testament, where you are obligated to give 10%, where you are obligated to tithe, and if you don't, you're going to be cursed. That is not the teaching of Malachi. It is not the teaching uh, of the New Testament. Now, in Malachi, they would be cursed, the people of Israel, because they were walking in disobedience to the covenant, okay? So, the uh, in, in Malachi, the windows of heaven opening up, what is that? It's God pouring out rain to water the crops, and he would bring abundance across. Matter of fact, go back to Malachi chapter 3. Paul, I hope I answered your question. We'll be getting into that more in depth. And I hope I'm not, well, it's probably shocking some people to hear this. But if we're going to be true to the text, he, he, here's my thing as a teacher of God's word. I try to be true to the text, historically, culturally, language, literary, not true to anybody's denomination, not true to any, any particular denomination's ideology or theology. I want to be true to the text. And, we, and if we're going to teach God's word um, and we're going to bring the freedom that he says that his word brings, we've got to teach it in its historical context. When we, started, when we start to add things, then we're doing what's known as eisegesis. We're putting things into the text that are not there. And to say that Malachi chapter three, um, the question I get, what was the first fruits of sons? Well, I probably will be covering that next week. And it's a lot to cover. You can see folks, it's a lot to cover. Like there are people who say, well, the first fruits are the tithes. Are they? We're going to be looking at that probably next week. <laughs> okay. No, they're not. <laughs> we'll be looking at that next week. All right. And we'll talk about the first fruits of, of the sons. Okay. So in Malachi chapter three, notice this, uh, I will open to you the windows of heaven and pour you out such a blessing that there should not be room enough to receive it. Now, here's the last thing we're going to cover. 
and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the fine vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. Okay, who or what is the devourer? Now, somebody might say, okay, Mike, this one I got. This one I know. This one I can't get wrong. The devourer is the devil, right? This is what we all have been heard. The devourer is the devil. I've heard people say, if you tithe, it like puts a protection around your family, puts a protection around your house so that your life pretty much is protected from the enemy. Now, it's a weird when I hear people teach this because they will go on to say, we're not saying nothing bad will ever happen. But then they go on to say, but if you tie, you're protected from the devourer. I'm going, well, wait a minute. How is it that nothing bad will ever happen, but I'm protected from the devourer? Okay. Uh, and I suspect that people don't want to push it too far because things happen to people. But they'll say things like, you know, if you always, if like, if your car is always breaking down or your, mach your, your washing machine is always breaking down, or you just seem like you never have any money, your money always gets eaten up. That's because of the devourer. Somehow you've let the enemy in, you've let Satan in, into your life because you did not tithe. But if you tithe, God will rebuke the devourer for your sake. He'll rebuke, and that means that God will rebuke the devil. And, and they'll say things like, and I remember because I was taught these things, this is the only place where God is rebuking the devil. Normally we're told to resist the devil, but here God said he will personally rebuke the devil and he'll keep the devil from messing with your stuff, messing with your money, messing with your car, messing with your kids. I've heard some people even say that, you know, if you're not tithing, maybe, and they will allude to or outright say, the enemies in your household, messing with your kids, because you've robbed God. And not that God is cursing you, but you place yourself under a curse. Anybody ever heard that type of teaching before? Here in the Zoom room, here on Facebook, have you ever heard that? This is what I was taught. These are the type of things I was told. And these are the type of things I'm still hearing today. Is the devourer the devil? Okay, the Hebrew word for devourer here is the Hebrew word akal, A-K-A-L, akal. And it refers to something that eats, that feeds, or that consumes. Something that eats, feeds, or consumes. It can be used of God. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 24, it says, our God is a consuming fire. The Hebrew word here for consume comes from akal. Our God is a consuming fire. Okay? It can be used of human beings eating food. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, God tells um, Adam, you, and he tells, yeah, he tells Adam, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but from the tree in the midst of the garden, you must not eat. The word eat here twice is a call. And also it can be used of animals. In Genesis chapter 37, verse 33, it, uh, it, uh, this is a story about Jacob uh, and Joseph, his sons, and remember uh, Joseph's brothers, sold him into slavery, but then they took his, his, his robe, his tunic, covered it with animal's blood, and they pretended like an animal had killed him. So in Genesis chapter 37, verse 33, Jacob says of his sons, Joseph, it is my son's tunic or robe. Some wild beast has devoured him. That's the new King James I'm quoting. Some wild beast has devoured him. Again, the word here is a call. So it can be used of God, it can be used of human beings, it can be used of animals. Here's the thing, nowhere in the biblical text is it used of Satan, devils, or demons. It's not used, and in Malachi chapter three, Satan is not even mentioned. It's not used of Satan. Somebody said, well, Mike, and this is what people say, what about John 10, 10? Because usually when I hear this, people say, you know, the Bible says, the thief comes not but to steal, to kill, and destroy, right? Go over to John chapter 10, verse 10. And they go, so Mike, you know, it says here, devourers, the Bible tells us the thief comes not but to steal, kill, and, de and destroy. That has to be Satan, right? Yeah, John chapter 10, verse 10. John chapter 10, verse 10. You, you ready? You know, this week I posted a, a meme on Facebook where it says that moment, it showed, it showed Belle from the Disney movie, uh, Beauty and the Beast, and she's holding the book and she looks real surprised. And the meme says, that moment when you realize that what you've been taught the Bible says, it doesn't say, <laughs> okay, you might be getting ready to have one of those moments. <laughs> All right, John chapter 10, verse 10. 
Jesus said, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Well, Mike, right there, it says the thief, Satan. He comes not to, but to steal, kill, and destroy. He is the devourer. Wait a minute. Where does it say Satan here? It doesn't. Satan, Satan, the devil, is not even mentioned in John chapter 10 and verse 10. Somebody goes, what? Michael, what are you saying? <laughs> of course it means that. Now, the Bible, there are scriptures that talks about Satan killing, that he's a murderer. There is a, bio, there is a verse when, when the parable of the, of the uh, sower talks about the thief comes and steal the, uh, the, the birds who come and steal the seed of Satan. It refers to him as a thief. Um, and in the book of Revelation, it refers to him as a destroyer. Okay. However, however, here in John chapter 10, notice I quoted uh, three other passages, but here in John chapter 10, it's not talking about Satan. He said, Michael, how can you say that? Context. Let's go back to John chapter 10, verse 1. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him for they do not know the voice of a stranger. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Then Jesus said to them again, most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who, are, all who ever came before me, all who ever came before me, all, not he, not Satan, all who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, plural, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come that they might have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep, but a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep, and I'm known of mine. Okay, let's go. Verse 15, as the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring. They will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Who is Jesus referring to? The thief, the thieves, remember plural, robbers, the strangers. These are false corrupt teachers and possibly even false messiahs who came before Jesus. They did not care for the sheep. They sought to exploit the sheep. You have to remember, as Jesus is teaching, he's using phrases. He's using words that alluded to the Torah, that allude to the Tanakh to the law, the prophets, and the writings. He is teaching the people Torah. Jesus himself said, I've come not to destroy the Torah, but I've come to fulfill it, which in that context means that I've come to teach it more fully. I've come to bring out its full meaning. Jesus is teaching the people Torah. And one of the, the techniques, one of these days, we're going to have to do a whole teaching on Jesus the rabbi and his rabbinic methods of teaching. One of the methods of teaching that Jesus is using is called to hint. He's alluding to things. When he utilizes certain words, he's alluding to certain passages that the people who had been schooled in the Torah, they would have known exactly what he's talking about. So when Jesus begins to talk about the shepherd and the shepherd coming to take care of the sheep, what is he alluding to? I don't have time to get into it, but you can go and look up Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 1 through 14, Ezekiel chapter 34, especially Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 1 through 10, and verses 22 to 23, you will see there that Jesus talks about shepherds who are not taking care of the sheep. And in Ezekiel, he's talking about the sheep being scattered, the sheep being devoured, the sheep being fleeced by the shepherds. The shepherds are not taking care of the sheep. This is who Jesus is talking about. He's talking about people before him and people during his time false teachers. Go over to Ezekiel chapter 34. I'm sorry. I was almost done. I got to show you this. See, this is why it's so important that we keep it in context. 
that we read these things in context. And again, if you, let me just say, if you don't know these, I didn't know these things at one point. So when you don't know them, we, we, can, we can move past it. But so for, for years, I was taught that John 10.10 10 referred to the devil. If you read John 10.10 in its full context, it makes no mention of the devil, of Satan, of demons whatsoever. And yet that's the meaning that we've imposed upon the text. Does Satan kill? Yes, there are other scriptures that speak to that. Does Satan steal? Yes, there's other scriptures that speak to that. Does he destroy? There are other scriptures that speak to that. Right concept, John 10.10 10 is the wrong scripture. Okay, you can have a right concept and the wrong scripture. John 10.10 10, 10 is not speaking of Satan as a thief. It is speaking of those who came before Jesus, probably also in the, uh, not probably, also in the time of Jesus, who were exploiting the sheep who are the people of God. In Ezekiel chapter 34, Ezekiel chapter 34, look at verse 1. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel, against them, prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherd feed the flocks? You eat the fat and clothe yourself with the wool. You slaughter, you kill the fatling, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost. Remember, Jesus said, I came to seek and to save that which was lost. People hearing him say this knew that what he was referring to. He's referring to Ezekiel. He's saying he's the shepherd. Remember, the, there's a verse of scripture in Matthew and Luke where it says he looked upon the people and they were like sheep without a shepherd. This is referring to, in a rabbinic way, a proto-rabbinic way of teaching scripture, Jewish methods of interpretation. It's alluding back to who Jesus is. He is the shepherd who is to come. We're going to read that in, verse, in just a second. Verse 4, the weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick. What did Jesus go about doing? Healing the sick. Nor bound up the broken. He did, I come to heal the broken of heart. Nor bought back what was driven away. I've come to seek and save that which was lost. Um, or sought what was lost. But with force and cruelty, you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. Remember, they were scattered. Remember, Jesus, he looked upon the people. They were like sheep without a shepherd. And they became food for all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill. Yes, my flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth, and no one was seeking or searching for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, says the Lord, surely my flock shall become a prey, and my flock became, surely my flock became a prey, my flock became food for every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd, nor did my shepherds search for my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my flock. Therefore, O shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand. I will cause them to cease feeding the sheep and the shepherds shall feed themselves no more, for I will deliver my flock from their mouth that they may no longer be food for them. And this is talking about people. The people are being exploited by the leaders. And these are the thieves and the robbers that Jesus was speaking of. Look at verse 22 of Ezekiel 34, verse 22. Verse 22, here's the promise. Therefore, I will save my flock and, there shall no, and they shall no longer be a prey. And I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will establish one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them. My servant David, he shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God. My servant David, a prince among them, I, the Lord, have spoken. Okay, so who is he speaking of? King David was dead. This is speaking of the Messiah to come. So when Jesus says, I am the shepherd, people know He's hinting back to Ezekiel chapter 34 because they have the Torah memorized. They, and they go, he's hinting back. He's saying he's the Messiah. He's saying we're in the time of the Messiah. And so the people knew what he was speaking of. So who are, who is the, 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 the thief that comes to steal, to kill, and destroy? It is the leaders who are using the sheep for their own benefit. They are exploiting the sheep. And, and as we have studied about the economics of the day, the high priests, some of the Pharisees, some of the rulers, they were exploiting the people economically. They were exploiting the people through Torah. 
They were using the Torah. They were misusing the Torah to get their own way. Jesus even said, you through your commandments make the word of God a none effect. And it was to benefit themselves. So John 10, 10, are anybody surprised? Like, oh my gosh, John 10, 10, not speaking of Satan. It's not in, not in that context. It is speaking of teachers, rulers, ministers who are misusing the flock of God, exploiting them for their own benefit. Hirelings. These are the people that Jesus is speaking against. Okay, so who or what is a devourer then in Malachi chapter three? Turn to Psalms 105, verse 34 and verse 35. Psalms 105. Turn there real quick. Who is a devourer? Keeping it in context, folks. Psalms 105. We're almost done here. Psalms 105. Let's look at verse 34 and verse 35. Psalms 105, verse 34 and verse 35. Now, this is speaking of God's judgment against Egypt when Egypt was holding Israel in bondage. This is speaking of one of the plagues. Keep in mind, this is God's judgment. And notice what happens. Verse 34. He spoke and locusts came, young locusts without number, and ate up all the vegetation in their land and devoured the fruit of their ground. Guess what ate up and devoured is in Hebrew? A call. Who's doing the devouring? Who's doing the eating? Locusts. Locusts are doing it. All right. Turn to Amos chapter four. Amos is another Israelite prophet. Amos chapter four. We're going to look at verse six and verse nine. Amos chapter four, verse six and nine. Also, I gave you cleanness of teeth. Now, this is God speaking through the prophet Amos to the people of Israel who are in disobedience. So he's talking to them about what the judgment will be, what the curse will be. Verse six, and I gave you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and lack of bread in all your places, yet you've not returned to me. So God is here basically saying, look, I blessed you. I did good to you, but you're not returning to me. And he says, I also withheld rain from you when there were, when there were still three months to the harvest. Oh, I'm sorry. I read that wrong. I'm, I'm sorry. Let me go back. I gave you cleanness of teeth in your cities and lack of bread in all your places, yet you have not returned to me. This is actually a judgment. It was a lack of bread, not he gave them bread. I, I misread that. Uh, there was a lack of bread. So in other words, there is judgment. There is lack. And he said, but still, the, let me say that the purpose of judgment when God does this to Israel, it's not to kill them. <laughs> it, it really isn't. It is to bring them back to repentance. That's the purpose of the judgment. So here God is saying, in other words, when there is affliction, the purpose of the affliction is to bring them back into, is to bring them to the place of repentance where they will return back to the Lord. So God says, look, I did this. I, 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 I caused there to be lack of bread in your midst, and still you did not return to me. I withheld rain from you when there were still three months to the harvest. I made it rain in one city. I withheld rain from another city. One part was rain upon, and where it did not rain, that part withered. So two or three cities wandered to another city to drink water, but they were not satisfied, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. Okay, so there was rain being withheld. Verse 9, I blasted you with blight and mildew when your gardens increased, your vineyards, your fig trees, and your olive trees, the locusts devoured them, a call, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. You will notice here that this matches in Amos, this is before the time of Malachi, but it matches the judgment and the curse on Israel in Malachi chapter three, verse 11. There's no rain and the locust is eating what? He's eating the produce of the fields. He's eating that which has grown. He's eating their vegetation. This is what locusts do. So when we go back to Malachi, let's go back to Malachi chapter three, And let's read it again when he says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. This is after they repented. They returned back to God. They're back in obedience. And then God says, I'm going to rebuke the devourer for your sake so that he, the devourer, would not destroy what? The fruit of your ground. What are we talking about? 
We're talking about locusts. We're talking about, as one scholar said, little creatures and insects that destroy agriculture. So I will rebuke the devourer for your sake so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. He's talking about their agricultural produce and the devourer of the fields are locusts, little creatures, insects that devour, I call the vegetation. This is the devourer. It's not speaking about Satan, okay? And again, the reason this was happening was because Israel was in disobedient to the covenant. It wasn't just because of, it wasn't just because of not bringing the tithe. Not bringing the tithe was symptomatic of a larger pattern of disobedience. We've covered that. The tithe, but see, the way some people teach this is that he, they teach the tithe will protect you and your family from the devil and from the devil's attacks. This is not what's being taught here. The tithe was not something that would protect you from the devil and the devil's attack. I always say that, you know, God is not running a protection racket through the tithe. The way some people teach the tithe is like God, you know, God the Father is actually the Godfather. And God is like the Godfather. He's like, okay, I'll give you an offer that you can refuse. Here's what we're going to do. You bring me the 10%. I'm going to protect your crops. I'm going to make sure nothing happens to you. But if you don't bring me the 10%, hey, you know, things happen. And people kind of do that with God today. Hey, you bring me the 10%. I'll make sure that all of your stuff is protected. Your kids will be okay. Your car will be okay. Your refrigerator will be okay. Your job will be okay. But if you don't bring me that 10%, you don't show me respect, you don't bring me that 10%, hey, things happen. I'm not saying I'm going to do anything to you, but you know things happen. We treat God like he's the Godfather rather than God the Father. God here is not telling believers, if you don't tithe, I'm going to let the devil get you. This is not the teaching. This is Israel that he's talking to who is in disobedient to the covenant. And when Israel is in disobedient to the covenant, what's the result? Read Deuteronomy chapter 28. Israel, matter of fact, when Israel comes under a curse, it's because they choose it. Deuteronomy chapter 28 and Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. God says to Israel, I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Now you choose. He tells them to choose life, but guess what? If they choose disobedience, they choose the curse. They bring the curse upon themselves by choosing to disobey the covenant. But this is not God telling you as a believer that if you don't bring 10%, you know, things happen. Can't guarantee that they won't. He's not the Godfather. He's God the Father. And he's not going to bring a curse upon you. And, and, and if you haven't tithed, and I know it can be so tempting. Listen, I remember when we, because I've been teaching this for a while. Do I practice the tithe according to uh, Leviticus and according to Numbers and according to Deuteronomy and according to the book of Nehemiah? No, I do not. Because I can't. Number one, there's no temple for me to take my tithe to. If I was to do it, do I give? Yes. Do I sometimes give 10%? Yes. Do I sometimes give more than 10%? Yes. Have I given less than 10%? Yes. Do I give consistently? Yes. Do I always give to the church my 10% or 15% or 20? No. We're going to talk about this. <laughs> okay. My point here being is that when, when there are times when I would as I was teaching this, and we would go through, there are times we've been through hard times financially, and the thought would come to my head, maybe it's because you, you, you're teaching people they don't have to tithe. Maybe that's why you're going through a hard time. I go like, no, no, because I know what the scripture says. So, and, and somebody said, well, maybe it was my, well, how do you explain it when I'm going through a good time? When I'm going through, when there's financial abundance, I'm still operating by the same truth of scripture as I've understood it from the biblical text. Now, we're going to talk about the fact that people say, well, I tithe and I was blessed. And then there are people who say, I, I tithe and I'm still struggling. Okay, <laughs> it goes both ways. My point here is that it's real easy to scare people. You know, the, and, I'll, and I'll just say this as we're, as, we're, as we're going to a close. When it comes to fear, or I'll put it like this. Uh, I was reading a book that deals with the brain, and one of the authors said this. When it comes to negative emotions, fear is a negative, what we call a negative emotion. When it comes to negative emotions, your brain is like Velcro. Negative emotions just stick. 
when it comes to positive emotion, your brain is like Teflon. It just kind of slows off. And so the author of this book on the brain was making the argument that in order to get good experiences to stick, you have to repeat them. But they were saying that when it comes to negative emotions, your brain just, and negative experiences, your brain just sticks to it. Um, and so my point here is this. If you are taught that you are going to be cursed because you don't bring the time, that you are going to lack because you don't bring the time, that you will always be in debt because you don't bring the time, that's a negative message that will stick with you. It will scare you and it will motivate you to tithe because who wants to be cursed? And it can be hard and it can be difficult to say, oh, well, wait a minute, I, you know, I don't want to be cursed because that is what you've been taught for so many years. Or somebody here in our, in, our, in our Zoom room said, I've been taught and heard from various teachers and pastors the common tithe message. They seem manipulative, coercive, and raise red flags. Yes. And that's the thing. Now, as I said last week, not all pastors who teach the tithe are trying to be manipulative or coercive, but there are some that are. I'm sad to say they are. And there are some who teach the tithe simply because it's the only way for them to make sure they have enough money coming in each week to take care of the financial budget. And I know this. I had a friend of mine, I think I've told this story before, who uh, is, is a rabbi, a messianic rabbi in Israel. He was working with a very well-known charismatic pastor in Dallas. I'm not saying who it is. And this pastor had him come in and he, the pastor was there and uh, the Messianic, actually he's a Messianic rabbi, not a Messianic pastor. He's a Messianic rabbi in Israel. So the rabbi came down, he's a friend of ours, and he was there and he saw that they were doing the tithe because this church was endeavoring to teach people the Jewish roots. So this Messianic friend of ours, Karen and mine, told him, hey, the way you're teaching that is not correct. And so he laid it out for him the correct way. And he knows that I teach this. He's seen my curriculum on this. And he, so he told him, he said, this is how this should be taught. He's a scholar. The guy listened to him, he said, okay. So he began to teach the people. He says, just teach your people to be generous. Just teach your people to give. So he began to teach his people to give. He, he just said, hey, you know what? We're not gonna do the tithing thing. You guys just give. And they taught them to give. His offerings went down. He called our friend and said, I can't do this. My offerings are down. We're not meeting our budget. I'm going back to the old way. So he went back to the old way of teaching in order to make sure his budget was met. I had somebody just contact me last week after I taught on one of these messages and they said, you know, what's sad is I went to a pastor friend of mine, or a former pastor, and I shared this type of information with them before. And they said to me, yeah, I, I, I know that, but I can't teach that because if I teach that, we won't be able to meet our budget. We won't be able to, we won't be able to get money in. So there are people, there are people teaching it. There are people who may even know this, I believe who do know this, but they still teach it. I mean, they know the stuff that I'm, I'm laying out here, but they still teach it to meet their budget. They know it's not correct. And we've got churches who have not only just thousands of dollars, but multi-million dollar budgets. They have to meet, they have to pay the mortgage on their churches. They have to meet the salaries of their staff. And they got, especially in large churches, now even small churches teach us, okay? I'm not saying just big churches teach us, but what I'm saying to you is that a lot of times this is being taught. This is my point. This is being taught so the monies will come in so we can meet our church budget. And I'm saying to you that if, if, if and especially if you are a pastor and you're hearing this and you do the research, I'm not asking you to give up what you're doing just simply because I say it. What I'm saying to you is you go back to the scriptures, look at everything I've looked up. That's one of the reasons I, I tell you the name of the books that I use. I talk about, hey, I got this from Jerusalem in the time of Jesus. I got this from Encyclopedia Judaica. I got this from uh, uh, all the different books that I've been quoting up to this point. It's so that you can get these books yourself and look it up yourself to see that Mike is not making this up. And the purpose of my saying this, again, is because we want people to move in liberty and freedom so they flourish, because it's in liberty and freedom that people flourish. But a lot of people have felt like if I don't give a tithe, I am cursed with a curse. And I'm here to tell you today, that is not talking to you. I hope that by laying all of this out, you have seen that in th that verse, in its context, is not even speaking to me as a believer. It can't speak to me as a believer. It doesn't even apply to me as a believer. And I want you to go free. 
I don't want you to live under the fear that if you don't tithe, you are therefore cursed with a curse. I don't want you to be in fear and the mindset that because you might be struggling financially right now is because you didn't give a tithe or you didn't give another tithe. One of the things we're going to cover, and, and this is something that I was taught, that if you don't tithe, when you start to tithe, you have to bring your tithe plus 20% to make up for the tithe that you, that you missed. I'm going to talk about this. This is, this is a teaching called Redeeming the Tithe. It is wrong. It's just flat out wrong. But I was taught that and I believed that for a long time. See, I'm telling you things that I believe, that I was taught. And then when Karen and I began to study the biblical text more closely, and we began to look at it in its context, in its Jewish context, in its ancient Near Eastern context, we began to say, wait a minute, some of these things we're teaching is wrong. I didn't come out of it. Let me say this. I did not stop teaching on the tithe because I was disappointed or disillusioned with the tithe. That is not why I stopped teaching. It wasn't like, oh man, you know, we give, we, we, we give tithes and we haven't been blessed yet. Actually, Karen and I, we've experienced blessing when we were tithed. But that's not why I, I didn't stop it because I just tithe and tithe and tithe and we're not getting blessed. I stopped because when I started studying the text, I began to see what I've been taught, what, I've, what I have been told that these passages mean, do not mean what I've been taught that they mean. I was like that meme, M-E-M-E, -M -M -E, that I put on my Facebook page a couple of days ago with Belle from Beauty and the Beast looking at a book saying that moment when you realize that what you thought the Bible said, the Bible actually didn't say. I share with you when I was talking with Karen about the tithe, and I said, Karen, there's a tithe that you're supposed to take up to Jerusalem, and you eat it before the Lord. And Karen, my wife, looked at me and said, uh-uh, you got to show me that in Scripture. <laughs> I don't believe that. She didn't believe me. I had to show it to her in Scripture. We didn't come out of this because we were disillusioned, because we were discouraged, because we were broke. We came out of it because we studied the Scriptures, and we said, this is not what we have been told. And as I've shared this with people over the years, one of our, the members of our fellowship today said to me, Mike, this has so helped me and so set me free. I pray that it helps you and set you free. And even if you feel like, well, Mike, I give, I tithe, I'm blessed. Hey, cool, cool. But I want you to start being more biblical about it. Because usually what happens is we tell other people, well, if you want to be blessed, do what I did. Give 10%. To which I would say, well, who are you giving it to? Which year are you giving it in? Are you giving the Mahat said? Shani, are you giving the Ma'atzer Ani? Are you giving the Ma'atzer Rishon? Are we in the first year, second year, third year, sixth year, or are we in year seven when you don't bring a tithe? If we say we are tithing according to the scripture, are we really tithing according to scripture? And I say, I have not yet met anyone who honestly tithes according to scripture. Now, we are going to talk about what giving are we called to do. We are good into that. We're going to be going more into that. Next week, though, I'm going to be dealing with, I believe, some myths, some misunderstandings, some misconceptions about tithing. And you say, well, I thought you've already covered that. We're going to cover a few more things. And we're going to talk about, I believe, next week, the whole first fruits thing. Because I hear a lot of people teaching that. Are you supposed to give the first fruits of your money every single month? We're going to talk about that, Lord willing, next week. I hope this was a blessing to you. If your mind was blown, do some study. <laughs> Hope you still love me. But if you're looking at this, you're like, oh, man, Mike, I, you gave me a lot to think about. That was the point of it. So, le so let me cover by saying this. Where are the key lessons here? Number one, the curse in Malachi 3 is due to Israel and the priest's overall disobedience to God. The tithing issue was symptomatic of a larger pattern of disobedience. The windows of heaven uh, was God, out, with God pouring out an abundance of rain to the land, to the, to the farmlands. And the blessing was the rain and the was abundant rain and abundant crops. It wasn't money. The blessing, the windows of heaven was God point out rain. The blessing was the abundance of rain and the abundance of crop that came from the rain. It wasn't money. And the devourer was not the devil, nor is it the problems of life. It was locusts and other insects that would eat the vegetation. This is what we have covered today. And, and like I said before, the thief in John chapter 10, verse 10, is not the devil. It is talking about teachers, leaders who exploit the sheep. So I hope this was a blessing to you today. If you think this will be a blessing to someone else, or you think, oh, I think this might scare somebody else, <laughs> share this with them anyway. I invite them to do study. Look up 
every passage, find the books, do the research yourself, walk in the ways of God rightly. All right, God bless you. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, somebody is asking, is there any way to get, this is our Zoom room, to get the handouts. I have been doing the, I've been actually redoing the handouts. So yes, the handouts for this section on the tithe, will we will upload them to a site because I decided I got to quit. I was doing handwritten notes. I stopped doing that. I'm now typing them out. So Deborah, you who asked that, yeah, you will be able to get that. All right. Okay, everybody, God bless you. I love you all. See you next week. We're going to talk some more about understanding what the Bible really says about the tithe. We'll see you all next week. Thank you for staying with me. For those of you Facebook land, thank you very much for sticking with us. God bless you. See you next week, Lord willing. Bye-bye.